very popular. Um, it's been exceeding our attendance expectations, so that's great. It's a little known secret, but we're helping get the secret out there. And uh, the paintings are quite beautiful, and we'd like to thank Roy Peterson for his hand in co-curating. So Beth is not with us. She is at home with baby Nell that joined us on September 12th. So that's also good news. The Morvan family is growing in so many ways. Um, so I want to thank you so much for coming. We are working on getting the temperature a little cooler in here. Um, but without further ado, I would like to introduce our curator of education and public programs, Debbie Lambert Brennan. Good evening, everyone. I am the lucky person who gets to bring you lots of fun and exciting things at Morvan. I've been only with the Morgan family since June, so this is my first experience here at the present day, and I'm really excited that it got to be an event with Louis Bamberger and his best friend, Linda Forgott. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Ms. Linda Forgott. Therefore, I'll wait till everybody gets settled. You can all hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I will begin. Good evening. Good evening. Some of the best advice I have ever been given came from Louis Bamberger, owner and operator of the great glamorous L. Bamberger and Company department store, who said, if you get a good offer, you should take it. <laughs> Which is what I did when I accepted your gracious invitation to speak about the recent publication of this book on the screen, Louis Bamberger, Department Store Innovator and Philanthropist, published by Brandeis University Press, and it stands out as the first and only biography ever written about Louis Bamberger. And May all the technology work. And second, as an award-winning book, Bamberger was recognized by the Newark Preservation and Landmarks Committee for its preservation of Newark and New Jersey history, and I, as the author, and Mr. Bamberger as the subject, were the recipients of the prestigious 2017 Charles F. Cummings Award. Well, by a show of hands, I'd like to ask, who among you are familiar with the Bamberger name? Wow. Who among you um, shopped at the Bamberger store? In Newark? Princeton. In Princeton, okay, a branch division of Bamberger's. And uh, anybody here work for Bamberger's? See, I always have to see. We're good, we're good. So, all right. Therefore, we shall begin. In 1912, when Louis Bamberger opened his new, modern, eight-story department store building located in the heart of downtown Newark, he timed it perfectly. That same year, Newark composer Philip Gifford published the song, I'm Glad I Live in Newark. So let's <laughs> listen and don't laugh. With lyrics 
I'm glad I live in Newark. You can follow along with me where men are up to date. And girls the finest in the world in looks and style, they're great. Of all bright spots in this big world, it is the one for me. I'll always stick to Newark. I'm living there right now. For Newark gives the best on earth, and Newark knows how. <laughs> Gifford had captured the mood of Newark's residents when he exclaimed, Newark knows how. Bamberger latched onto it for his advertising and then set about using his genius to promote the advantages of living and working and, of course, shopping in downtown Newark. Bamberger started his business in 1892. His first store was located at 147 Market Street. From the outset, Bamberger was a full-service department store that meant it he needed a delivery wagon and a horse to pull it. And Bamberger never forgot that he spent his last dollar on a horse that he himself had named Finnegan. <laughs> Initially, Bamberger's store struggled with lack of space to display its goods. <clears throat> However, what it didn't have in space, it more than made up by its unparalleled, remarkable, and enthusiastic customer service you remember what customer service was like. <laughs> the opening of a new, more modern Bamberger's department store in 1916 was a major event in Newark's business and civic life. This was the year that Bamberger's placed a large clock on its building's exterior, and this is what it looked like. It became one of Newark's most famous landmarks and the inspiration for naming of the Jewish Historical Society of New Jersey's exhibit. This is where I work. Meet, whoop, go ahead. Meet me under Bamberger's clock. Mm -hmm. Memories of how shoppers met a boyfriend or a girlfriend, a parent, or a business associate under the Bamberger clock were included in the numerous emails I received while writing this book. I still chuckle when I think about the woman who told me that she had gotten engaged under Bamberger's clock. Well, how did Louis Bamberger become such a successful retail merchant? He did it through advertising. The following advertisements that I will show you now ran in the newspapers located within 50 miles of his store, and they were the creation of prominent Newark artist Arthur Elder. Here they are. The Greater Bamberger Store welcomes you. The Greater Store as a fashion center that harkens back to the days of elegance and fashion and no jeans. And the magic of the new store, well, let me just spend a few seconds on this advertisement. Around 1912, several Chicago stores presented a fashion show inspired by the enormously popular novel and play, The Garden of Allah, by author Robert Hitchens. The play opened in New York, and just like Hamilton, you couldn't get a ticket. <laughs> Department stores featured actors dressed as Arabs in fantastic costumes who roamed through the store's aisles. Now, I certainly think that this might have made for an interesting day's shopping. My point is that even Bamberger's ads were a work of art, which leads me to a different kind of question. What is unique about these advertisements, meaning the question, is that nowhere that is there a request for anyone to buy anything. I mean, who owns a department store and doesn't want you to buy something? Instead, Bamberger issued an invitation to his customers to visit his store so as to become acquainted with its many features and beautiful displays, thousands took him up on his offer. When Bamberger learned that a few of his guests had taken mm, a few of souvenirs from their visit, such as the flatware and the hand-staked china from the store's restaurant, he just smiled and regarded it as a great way to promote his business. <laughs> Bamberger's success was a double-edged sword. The more successful the store became, the more customers it attracted, which makes sense. This meant 
that more land had to be purchased for future additions. Bamberger's attorney, John Harden, was given the job to negotiate with owners of stores adjacent to Bamberger's store. All was done in secrecy through what was known as Chester Realty. Now, Bamberger was a man who kept his business dealings close to his best. And to my mind, he was someone who would have agreed with Ben Franklin, who is credited with having said, three can keep a secret as long as two of them are dead. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, you can check for those quotations. In 1921, with World War I over, there was a quick uptick in sales accompanied by a huge expansion to its building. Formerly known as Newark's Great White Store, you can read the text from the newspaper story, Bamberger's was rebranded as one of America's great stores, and it was. In fact, under Louis Bamberger's watchful eye, L. Bamberger and very popular. Um, it's been exceeding our attendance. very popular. Um, it's been exceeding our attendance expectations, so that's great. It's a little known secret, but we're helping get the secret out there. And uh, the paintings are quite beautiful, and we'd like to thank Roy Peterson for his hand in co curating So Beth is not with us. She is at home with baby Nell that joined us on September 12th. So that's also good news. The Morgan family is growing in so many ways. Um, so I want to thank you so much for coming. We are working on getting the temperature a little cooler in here. Um, but without further ado, I would like to introduce our curator of education and public programs, Debbie Lambert Redmond. Good evening, everyone. I am the lucky person who gets to bring you lots of fun and exciting things at Mormon. I've been only with the Morgan family since June, so this is my first experience here at the present day, and I'm really excited that it got to be an event with Louis Bamberger and his best friend, Linda Forgott. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Ms. Linda Forgott. Therefore, I'll wait till everybody gets settled. You can all hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. 
So I will begin. Good evening. Some of the best advice I have ever been given came from Louis Bamberger, owner and operator of the great glamorous L. Bamberger and Company department store. Reading the ticker tape off the New York Times has a certain kind of quality to it that makes you think, oh my. Well, country club set. And this cover, I often put, and I've seen many of them, one was more beautiful than the other. And at a time when the art world's favorite word was modern, oh, unless I forgot her, one more, Charm featured a cover designed and signed by Pablo Picasso. Check Picasso's signature on the lower left-hand corner. Now this would have been one copy that I wish that somebody would have given to me. I have several. Charm also featured articles by John Cotton Dana, whose influence is explained in the introduction of your exhibit catalog and probably went up, when you went upstairs that your tour guide, uh, Mr. Pedersen, or curator, would have spoken about John Cotton Dana. His influence in Newark's culture and art is best described by the headline in this Newark Sunday Call article. Although Charm ceased publishing in 1932, it has not lost its charm, no pun intended, for researchers interested in women's magazines for that period of time in the 1920s, even included a British researcher who had come over to study, go through the Charm issues, and she got her or oh, her stipend from the Kluge Foundation located at the Library of Congress and after going through all of them, as many as they have at the Library of Congress, her net expression was, or the end of her interview on C-SPAN was, Louis Bamberger should be praised for what he did in terms of publishing this remarkable woman's magazine. Now, one of the most important dates in the history of 20th century Newark was March 14, 1924. It was on this date that Louis Bamberger silver-plated shovel in hand, and I've held that shovel, broke ground for what is now Newark Museum. In 2015, WBGO reporter Ang Santos did a radio story about Louis Bamberger, and he selected May 15th as this was Bamberger's birthday. And then he called me to ask, did I know anything about Louis Bamberger? <laughs> And here's Ang's interview. By the time the Roaring Twenties hit, department store owner Louis Bamberger was one of the most successful and cultured men in America. In 1923, Bamberger proposed to the Board of Trustees in Newark to build a place where people could come to enjoy the arts. He was the sole donor of the Newark Museum. Linda Forgosh is the executive director and curator of the Jewish Historical Society Metro West. Bamberger knew the city would never have a museum for art and culture if he didn't donate it. He said, when I announced it, I wanted to come as a complete surprise. Ben Berger was a private man. He rarely spoke in public. So when the press came banging down Ben Berger's door. He had already looked ahead and arranged passage headed to the Mediterranean where he was accompanied by his two sisters and they were gone for three months, long enough in his mind that all the hubbub would literally die down and the famous John Cotton Dana would sit down with Mr. Bamberger and decide what this was all going to look like and what would North citizens think. Well, we'll do a little recap to see how the newspapers treated Mr. Bamberger's remarkable announcement. Bamberger hired the architect, Jarvis Hunt, and he spent $500,000 cash out of his pocket for a museum building. But in the end, we all know how cost overrides work. And so he wound up laying out $650,000. But the reason he gave for his generosity was he felt that he owed the city something for helping him to grow his business. And it's true. He had no plans to hang around after this announcement. Instead, he boarded that ocean liner that took him on a cruise in the Mediterranean for a three-month tour of the Middle East, to repeat, to avoid those inevitable public accolades. 
but in my mind, he may have been better off staying at his home in the, at the Jersey Shore rather than falling overboard from the lighter, which is mentioned in this headline, or boat that was used to carry him from ship to shore. You could not imagine the uproar of the headline that you see here of Bamberger falling into the Mediterranean had on his employees. First of all, Bamberger was admired and genuinely loved by his employees. And second, their jobs and Newark's economy depended on his well-being. But it was museum director John Cotton Dana, who you see here, this portrait of Dana was paid for by Mr. Bamberger and a gift to the museum, who was given the task of thanking Mr. Bamberger for his gift of a museum building. <coughs> Dana is on the right and Bamberger is on the left. And the date for the dedication was May 14, 1925, one day before Louis's birthday. In preparation for the dedication, its trustees hired world-renowned metallurgist John Flanagan, Newark's John Flanagan, to execute this bronze relief of Louis Bamberger and another bronze plaque with an inscription acknowledging Bamberger's gift. These two items, as you see them here, flank the walls to the entrance of the Newark Museum today, as we sit here, and can be seen by visitors who enter the building through its ornate doors, which in themselves, I think, are a work of art. Bamberger's family turned out en masse to witness what was a new chapter in the progress of Newark's cultural arts. Now, I have made an account of what preceded the dedication of Newark Museum, simpler actually than it really was. This part of my story begins a century ago with an idea shared by two friends. One was Louis Bamberger, the owner and operator of L. Bamberger and Company Department Store, and the other, and this is the other, a different portrait of John Cotton Dana, head librarian of the Newark Public Library. Together, together, they incorporated the Newark Museum Association, never dreaming that today's Newark Museum would have become the largest such institution in New Jersey, having earned international recognition for its achievements in arts, science, and industry. And to set the record straight, Fans of today's museum might be interested to know that Newark Museum didn't always look the way it does now. Instead, it looked like this. This was the Newark Public Library, but from 1901 to 1909, its fourth floor was used to feature items such as china, silver, and occasional Aunt Betsy's family tea service, most of which were donated by well-meaning citizens who thought their family heirlooms were worthy of being seen by the greater public. Doing double duty, first as head librarian, it was John Cotton Dana who became the first director of the Newark Museum. Dana's quote, seen on the screen, speaks to his relationship with Louis Bamberger. Bamberger's department store, like many department stores, was, quote, easily reached, open at all hours, and more like a good museum of art than any of the museums we have yet established. No wonder Bamberger was willing to put a considerable fortune behind establishing a museum for the city of Newark, even if he and Dana, and most people don't know about it, had a very contentious relationship or that Bamberger <clears throat> had not even bothered to tell Dana of his plans to build a museum. Well, to read the entire story, which is mighty juicy, you have to buy my book, which explains all the prerequisites Bamberger had in mind in advance of donating the Newark Museum. Newark Museum opened to the public on March 16, 1926, Think about that. We can't get the driveway done in a year, but in one year he put a hole in, he put a hole, uh, he broke ground. The second year um, they dedicated the building, and the third year all of a sudden the building is filled from first floor to fifth floor to sixth floor, filled with collections because Bamberger had the magic touch. 
he could get a job done. Remember, Newark knows how. Newark Museum opened to the public. 3,000 people attended opening night. The only one not there was, guess, Louis Bamberger. Louis Bamberger. Mm -hmm. He stayed in Florida. Rather than deal with crowds, I told you he was a shy guy of well-wishers, he sent a telegram apologizing for his absence. Bamberger's museum was treated with head headlines such as, Newark Museum was intended to be a museum for young and old alike. And New York's art world, including Mr. and Mrs. John Sloan and Mr. and Mrs. Robert Henri. Henri was the painter of this portrait of Mary Gallagher, came to view a collection of 23, 1023, works by modern American painters, 16 of which were gifts from Bamberger's sister, Caroline Fold. How Carrie came to select these paintings is the subject of an interview I conducted with Ulysses Dees. Anybody here know Ulysses? You do, okay, so you know he's an important figure in the history of cult, uh, culture and arts in Newark, that's for sure. But I conducted, I went, you know, the museum, the, what is it, um, if Mohammed doesn't go to the mountain, the mountain goes to Mohammed, it's sort of story. So I interviewed Ulysses for an hour and a half to come up with three minutes. If I see your eyes glaze over, I'm gonna stop the interview and move on. But he is, uh, as a side, the great grandson of uh, President Ulysses S. Grant. His name is Ulysses Grant Dietz. And he is Newark Museum's chief curator and curator of decorative arts. This is what he looks it's like and what he has to say. What Carrie's personal taste was, because I think she, being who she was, she wanted to do what Mr. Dana wanted to do. She wanted to do what the museum wanted rather than what she wanted. So she didn't insist that I want this artist or I want that artist. She simply uh, went with the instincts that I suspect. We don't have all the records of what the conversations were between her and Mr. Dana. And uh, as a lady, I'm sure Mr. Dana was gentler with her than he would have been even with her brother or her husband because men were frank with each other in ways that I suspect that Mr. Dana and Mrs. Fold were more polite with each other. She I'll cut it off, otherwise I'll keep you a little too long. But you can come back and I'll play it again. Other paintings that were purchased after her passing were funded through a fold bequest. Now the title of this is Sheridan Theater. I think this is a pretty clever crowd. Who's the artist? Hopper. Hopper, thank you very much, Edward Hopper. And the museum's signature painting, the city interpreted by Stella. Joseph Stella, works by William Glackens, and also John Sloan. And it wasn't the first time Bamberger used his clout to bring great works of art to Newark Museum. Newark's greatest art show opened at the Newark Museum in 1941 the public was invited to inspect 44 art treasures from England, Holland, Belgium, Australia, and France. The European masterpieces that had been lent to the New York and San Francisco World Fairs could not be sent back to Europe so as not to risk the ocean trip because what was going on that made it dangerous? World War, World War II. Yes, thank you in the front. Instead, Louis Bamberger, who was at that time vice president of the museum, once again assumed all costs. As for Bamberger, he himself, oh, let me go back, donated items of silver for the museum's collections as reported in this 1924 article in Newark's Sunday Call. It was Bamberger's intent to show Newark's silversmiths how to perfect their craft. The following were gifts to the museum's collections, silver collections, from Mr. Bamberger. An, oh, let me go back. An 18th century silver can or mug, a porringer or community drinking cup dated 1750, and two pieces by renowned Swedish silversmith George Jensen 
that were purchased by Bamberger in 1922, and according to Ulysses, the first such items by the great George Jensen to be exhibited or owned by any museum in America, compliments of Louis Bamberger. There was, in addition, a compote, also Jensen's design, and a covered sugar bowl. Well, what about this headline in the Newark Evening News? Bamberger gift to museum recalls revolutionary romance between Elizabeth Schuyler and Alexander Hamilton. Pretty good. Um, but when I move on a little bit, I want you to think about the fact that I'm going to use Hamilton as my backdrop, meaning the real Hamilton with the hip hop uh, lyrics just a little bit at the beginning. What they have in common that both, both Lynn Juan Miranda and Louis Bamberger were trend setters. So let's take a chance and move a little forward. So I thought to myself, well, was Bamberger prescient when he purchased this portrait of Elizabeth Schuyler in 1924? Or that um, Hamilton would appear on the cover of PBS? Not even Louis Bamberger could have anticipated the success of the Broadway play Hamilton. So how about a little bit of the introduction? Anybody here see Hamilton? Also, we have a few lucky souls in the audience. very popular. Um, it's been exceeding our at at attendance expectations, so that's great. It's a little known secret, but we're helping get the secret out there. And uh, the paintings are quite beautiful, and we'd like to thank Roy Peterson for his hand in co-curating. <laughs> so Beth is not with us. She is at home with baby Nell that joined us on September 12th. So that's also good news. The Morvan family is growing in so many ways. Um, so I want to thank you so much for coming. We are working on getting the temperature a little cooler in here. Um, but without further ado, I would like to introduce our curator of education and public programs, Debbie Lambert Brennan. Good evening, everyone. I am the lucky person who gets to bring you lots of fun and exciting things. I've been only with the Morgan family since June, so this is my first experience here at the present day, and I'm really excited that it got to be an event with Louis Bamberger and his best friend, Linda Forga. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Ms. Linda Forga. Therefore, I'll wait till everybody gets settled. You can all hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I will begin. Good evening. Good evening. Some of the best advice I have ever been given came from Louis Bamberger, owner and operator of the great glamorous L. Bamberger and Company department store, who said, if you get a good offer, you should take it. <laughs> Which is what I did when I accepted your gracious invitation to speak about the recent publication of this book on the screen, Louis Bamberger, Department Store Innovator and Philanthropist, published by Brandeis University Press, and it stands out as the first and only 
biography ever written about Louis Bamberger. And may all the technology work. And second, as an award-winning book, Bamberger was recognized by the Newark Preservation and Landmarks Committee for its preservation of Newark and New Jersey history, and I as the author, and Mr. Bamberger as the subject, were the recipients of the prestigious 2017 some mighty prestigious mathematician to fill that role. And he did, meaning Flexner did. And you see who it is, Albert Einstein. And you may think that bringing Albert Einstein from Germany to Princeton in 1933 was some might call a slam dunk. You know, it's base basketball season now. Far from it. Many do not know the story of how a group in Brookline, Massachusetts, called the Woman Patriot Organization, worked to deny Einstein his visa. The State State Department demand that the world's most famous scientist, Albert Einstein, be refused entry into this country. The story caused a huge firestorm, with the New York Times poking fun at the group for suggesting that Bamberger and the officers of the Institute be indicted for no less than conspiracy and high treason. It wasn't until influential Harvard professor Felix Frankfurter, later Associate Justice of the Supreme Court and a trustee of the IAS years going forward, intervened and got the State Department to apologize and give Einstein his visa. Now this photo of Einstein, I think the right word is debarking the ocean liner he had traveled across the ocean, shows him clutching his violin for fear that someone would steal it. <laughs> and he was right to worry. It wasn't unusual for reporters and onlookers to try to grab his hat or tear his clothes just to get a piece of that world famous scientist. But in my mind, I guess it was his penalty for having his theory of relativity change the way science viewed gravity. And here is, compliments of the IAS, Albert Einstein as the lone walker on the Institute's campus. Institute's not far from here for those of you, you know, who want to get the address. And the building in the background, also there, is Fold Hall, named for Carrie Fold's husband, Felix. And for those of you who would like to know more about Einstein and Bamberger's friendship, which doesn't turn up unless you do a lot of research, I can give you the contact information for the Onlog block, or you picked up a copy of It's All Relative as you walked in the door. My compliments. It's like a party favor. It was Einstein's appointment to fill the position of head mathematician that captured the public's imagination. His fame preceded him as the scientist who had proven his relativity theory. Now many people hailed Einstein's theory of relativity, but let's face it, very few really understood how it worked. But in the interest of science, here's Einstein, E equals mc squared. There's a test after this, by the way. Here's an explanation of Einstein's theory of relativity coming from the least likely source you would imagine. This is the 100th anniversary this month of Einstein presenting his general theory of relativity. All right. I know it's famous, okay? Why is it epoch making? Why did it change everything? So we did not understand how the force of gravity worked before Einstein gave us the Didn't general you? theory. He says if there's no matter, no energy, then space is flat, right? Which okay. would mean that if you roll something, say a planet is moving through space, it goes on a straight line. Okay. Okay. But now let's bring in the sun, right? This is the sun right here. And he says in the general theory of relativity that the sun, merely by virtue of being in space, warps the fabric of space, actually, and time. Okay, and that's vital. Like it makes like a, like a well. A well, in a sense, because now if we take the Earth, right, and we set it in motion, it now goes into orbit because the fabric of space is nudging it around. And that, according to Einstein, is how gravity works. I'm going to pause just for a second to tell you 
that Louis Van Berger and Albert Einstein were like kindred spirits. If you read the article, you will discover how much they had in common language and, and a love of music. And Bamberger had a box in almost every um, uh, concert hall in New York City, and he would invite Einstein to join him. And Einstein couldn't resist. And you know that Einstein was probably one of the most recognizable figures in the world, just that white mane of hair. And he would come and he would sit in a box, and people sitting on the lower level would always look up to see, you know, what all these well-to-do people had to do to get these boxes overlooking Artaris Toscanini playing some remarkable composition until the moment they spy Bamberger, not Bamberger, but Einstein. And all of a sudden, there was like a buzz that ran through the concert hall and everybody going like this as if to say, look, there's Einstein. I can assure you that the people those evenings that Einstein was in the audience went home to tell their family probably through Thanksgiving dinners in perpetuity that they were in the same theater as Albert Einstein listening to the same Arturo Toscanini who probably took second fiddle, no pun intended because Einstein loved the violin, to the great scientist. Well, Bamberger was a proponent of education as a key to success. And he conducted a competition for a sculptor to come up with a design for what became the Bamberger Award for Scholarship. I'm wearing it. I didn't win it, but you don't want to hear the long story made short. It could never be made that short. This medal was given to valedictorians of Newark's four public high schools, not because they were just good students, which obviously they were, but because they had leadership qualities and they did community service and he expected out of them what he hoped would be the future of Newark, youngsters who would associate their medal and stay around to help him build his beloved city of Newark, which always was curious to me. Bamberger, with all of what I'm telling you, was a man who never graduated from high school, and he had no connection to Newark. He was born in Baltimore, but he found himself a niche and he certainly was good about it. Well, I've spent eight years, the best years of my life, as they would say, searching for information about Bamberger's and where did I go to find it? Well, I went to the New Jersey Historical Society in Newark, the Newark Public Library, Huntington, Long Island, to Avon-by-the-Sea, which is a town located at the Jersey Shore, to Macy's at Herald Square, because they had an archives, Princeton's Institute for Advanced Study, and to the, my right is Erica Mosner. Raise your hand. Erica was invaluable in my research. She is an archivist at the Institute for Advanced Study. If you need anything or any information about anything, she could probably find it for you. I went to Baltimore, because Bamberger came from Baltimore. I spent days at the Library of Congress, and I even traveled to Oakland, California. And I use all of these sources to tell Mr. Bamberger's story. But then I came up with a series of questions that I started to ask myself. Well, here's all this research. What, what should people really maybe want to know? So here's my first question, and now I'm starting to wind down. How was it possible for me to write Bamberger's biography since he left no business records, he didn't keep a diary, and he kept his private life very private. My answer, research, research, research. Question, so what made it possible for Bamberger to sit on boards of 30 volunteer organizations and still find time to run his business? My answer, Bamberger had loyal employees that he could trust to get the job done. The store's success was attributed to its outstanding customer service. And the fact that the staff, you see them here, was well-trained, and they knew their stock. Every six weeks, all new employees were expected to take salesmanship classes. Now, this story is about Bessie Posner. It's not long, but it's kind of sweet. Who was looking to purchase something in Bamberger's silverware department for her nieces and nephew, who wanted to give their parents a 25th wedding anniversary present. The salesperson didn't hesitate for a moment. She excused herself 
disappeared into the stockroom, and came back carrying a chest of shiny silver flatware. What was unique about the flatware that it was engraved with the letter G, which was perfect because the family's name was Grossman. Apparently, the person who ordered the monogram silver didn't pick it up. <laughs> so the silver was sold to Bessie at half price, and Bambergers recouped some of its losses. And by the way, this is what the silver were looked like, where the silver looked like. If you got close enough, you would see the letter G. So my question is, how did I come by such a treasure? And my answer is, the couple celebrating their 25th anniversary were my grandparents, Eva and David Grossman, and I owned the Bamberger silver. <laughs> so why did Bamberger refuse to be president of any of the volunteer organizations he founded or funded? Answer, Bamberger agreed to hold the title of honorary president because he could exercise more control if he didn't have to answer to boards of trustees. That may ring a note with some of you who are active in community service, all those boards of trustees. So what did Bamberger have to offer a volunteer organization? My answer, it was the use of his name on their letterheads that in my opinion was like money in the bank. Question, what happened to all the institutions credited with Bamberger's generosity? My answer, they still exist but now have different names. Louis Bamberger died on March 11, 1944 at age 88, two months short of 89. He spent a lifetime avoiding public accolades, refused to have his name on buildings, and firmly believed, these are his words, that no one will care what I say, they will only care what I do. Still, he couldn't stop the estimated 1,200 mourners who attended a memorial service at Temple B'nai Jeshurun from paying their respects to him. Bamberger had lost its first citizen, adopted son, and one of America's great merchant princes, but I have gained a friend. My statement about Bamberger not having received any public accolades maybe needs to be revised. After Bamberger's death, a local Masonic lodge arranged to put his name on a World War II Liberty ship, cargo ship. And you see top left, it says, if you look hard, SS Louis Bamberger. So I'm telling you the truth. No false news over here. Such ships were named for individuals no longer living, criteria one, or criterion one, and had made a significant contribution to American life. Well, that sure fit Mr. Bamberger to a T. So on November 9th, 1944, the SS Louis Bamberger was released into the waters off the coast of Jacksonville, Florida, headed for Europe with cargo for the troops fighting World War II. Now, numerous reviews have been written about my Bamberger biography. One even came from as far away as the Philippines. Happily, they have all been favorable, otherwise I wouldn't mention them. <laughs> However, this is the one that has the most meaning for me, and it reads, it's only five lo lines long, but boy, it is a great thing. Dear Ms. Forgash, I found your book extremely interesting and informative, not only about Louis Bamberger, but about the Newark of his day, which overlapped with mine. I speak not only as an admirer, and I want to repeat that word, admirer, of your book, but as a York boy who worked at Bamberger's for two Christmases in the 40s during high school as a stock clerk in the ladies' shoe department. And it is signed with a drum roll. Sincerely, oh. Philip Roy. Oh. You get that letter, you better make sure you are sitting down. <laughs> And I would sweeten this deal, but I don't want to hold you any longer as to the handwritten note I got from him two weeks ago congratulating me on the award I showed you in slide two. Well, if you'd like to know, hopefully you will be among those I mentioned here who is currently reading Bamberger's Diary 
It is biography. It is Bruce Nordstrom, second generation of Nordstrom's department stores. You know, when you got a good idea, uh, imitation is the highest form of flattery. They all shared ideas among themselves, and they learned from one another, but no more so than from Louis Bamberger. Well, I'd like to close this program with a selection from Aaron Copeland. Copeland visited Newark's Y in the mid-1930s and conducted his popular American Symphony, Appalachian Spring. Many of us know Copeland for his ever popular fanfare to the common man. You, you will recognize it. It has special significance for Newark as it was played at the dedication of the New Jersey Performing Arts Center in 1997. very popular. Um, it's been exceeding our attendance expectations, so that's great. It's a little known secret, but we're helping get the secret out there. And uh, the paintings are quite beautiful, and we'd like to thank Roy Peterson for his hand in co-curating. So Beth is not with us. She is at home with baby Nell that joined us on September 12th. So that's also good news. The Morgan family is growing in so many ways. Um, so I want to thank you so much for coming. We are working on getting the temperature a little cooler in here. Um, but without further ado, I would like to introduce our curator of education and public programs, Debbie Lambert Grubman. Good evening, everyone. I am the lucky person who gets to bring you lots of fun and exciting things. I've been only with the Morgan family since June, so this is my first experience here at the present day, and I'm really excited that it got to be an event with Louis Bamberger and his best friend, Linda Forgo. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Ms. Linda Forgo. Therefore, I'll wait till everybody gets settled. You can all hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I will begin. Good evening. Good evening. Some of the best advice I have ever been given came from Louis Bamberger, owner and operator of the great glamorous L. Bamberger and Company department store, who said, if you get a good offer, you should take it. <laughs> Which is what I did when I accepted your gracious invitation to speak about the recent, he's really not the best businessman, he got himself a job, he didn't feel well, he went back to New York, Bamberger learned about him, you know, because he was looking for a partner, I, and uh, that's how they got together. They were German-American Jews, and they shared common interests. And by the way, the people who own Macy's are the Strauss family, and they too are German-American Jews, et cetera, and so forth, and uh, would have served on the IAS initial board of trustees. Except yes, for the sir. Titanic, right? What's that? Except for the Titanic, right? Yes, took one of the brothers down. That's true. You're right. Yes? Well, Louis Bamberger had no direct children. What, what can you tell us about his surviving relatives? Well, he was one of seven children. Uh, none of them, except one brother, had only one child. Several of his sisters had been engaged. Both lost their 
uh, fiancés in one of, in world in the wars. Um, he didn't get along with his brother. He actually learned the trade of having to be a retail merchant, working for his uncles. And for those from Baltimore familiar with the area, the department store was known as Hutzler Brothers. That was what was known to Baltimore. That's where he learned the trade. But he didn't want to stay in school. He just didn't enjoy it. He begged his parents, can I go off? And that was the story. But what he did learn in terms of that family connection is that Baltimore's Jews were extremely successful, especially in the ready-to-made wear and provided uniforms for the Union and the Confederate armies. They had that ready-wear lock, uh, Sonneborn was the name, and they would come to Bamberger's home, and they would sit and talk business, and Bamberger was a listener, and this is how he learned a business should operate. A lot of ideas happened all in his parents' living room. They were also anti-abolitionists and uh, had to flee the, meaning his parents, Baltimore, on the back of a wagon with a horse and went to Philadelphia because there were many forces out Confederate leaning that were unhappy about any position that they took that was pro-slavery, uh, anti-slavery, forgive me. Yes? Do you know much about his merchandising? I had heard that um, he would get lots of things, uh, groups of things, and then reshape the, uh, by putting together different things in the same package and putting a pretty package on it. It was a big seller at Christmas time. So you could get socks and underwear or something all mixed in the same package. If you heard it, it's so. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard it from my aunt who worked for... For Bay Burgers? Yes. There wasn't anything that was too far out of the realm of reasonable. I mean, when Bamberger first opened his store, and it was supposed to be for middle and upper middle class people, because I spent a lot of time on art and culture, I could have just spent it all on how Bamberger was successful on that level as a retail merchant. He even had, for a period of 17 years, he had a poultry exhibition in his store. Huh. Who has chickens in their store? Fold said, this is a terrible idea. Bamberg said, oh no it isn't. And he was right, people came in. Newark then was farmland. And people had farms, and they raised poultry. And he brought them in that way. Oh. Go figure it. He also had, and I think the sweetest story, is, is that he would deliver anything to you. A spool of thread. He would sell you a bird, and then deliver the bird seed. But the best phone call came of all, of a woman who called the store and said, listen, I want you to come to pick up this bird seed. And the woman on the telephone said, well, well, didn't you get your bird here? Yeah, she said, but I don't need the bird seed. Well, she said, well, why not? Because the bird died. <laughs> and they took the bird seed back. You never had customer service like that. And I think we all mourn the day we have now become enmeshed in something known as a menu, press one, press two, press three, et cetera, and so forth. Any more questions? Yes? In the, um, the timing of, uh, I'm not sure I have the timing right, but in the Baltimore days, was he um, in relationship at all with Henry Matisse, the artist? Mm, no, not that I know of. Because um, Henry Matisse was very good friends with the Cohn sisters. Yes, that I would understand. But the Cohns were friendly with Bamberger's family. That's what I'm saying. Yes, okay, yes. Yeah. Yes. And the Cohn sisters um, had some of Matisse's very earliest works because he lived with them for a while. And I highly recommend going to that museum because it's a very uh, exciting museum to see how Henry Matisse of the pain of uh, in his maturity of his, uh, right. of his art. Well, the Cohen sisters had gotten in on the ground floor. You know, much like the collection in Philadelphia, if I could think about the gentleman who collected all of these Farm, great farms, farms. farms. Thank you very much. I know I was there, but I had to think about it, et cetera, and so forth. Yes. And I often wondered, how do people really see, you know, what's going to be great art years from now? It's somewhat like the story that was on television this morning of the male Madonna, did you catch it? Painted by Leonardo da Vinci. I thought that was a fascinating story. It's only up for $100 million. Christie's is selling it. 
You can write a check. It doesn't mean that it cashes or not, but it's out there. <laughs> yes, any more? I can tell you that um, Louis and I have been living together all these years. I am very fond of him, and I hate to think that eventually he and I are going to have an amicable divorce. <laughs> but nothing goes on forever, even though I must say I'm booked through March, so I guess there's life there, et cetera, and so forth. Are we good? Our co-curator, I don't know if you want to say a few words about the portrait of Einstein that happened. The portrait is the first uh, portrait of Einstein painted in America. Oh. It was uh, painted for, uh, uh, for blind for the event held in York at the Newark Armory, welcoming Einstein to America, replacing his lost citizenship, and uh, welcoming him to Princeton. And it has been called the Princeton Portrait. So Linda was nice enough to really revamp her presentation for us, especially for this evening. So thank you so much for that. And any other questions you may have about Louis Bamberger and even his connection with Einstein are going to be in the book. So you want to be sure that we have the books right here to sign. And my pleasure. Happy to personalize them. So again, please, please thank Linda and. Thank you.